Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marsha McNutt. I'm president, still president, of the National Academy of Sciences. And welcome to our award ceremony in which the National Academy of Sciences is going to recognize 17 individuals for their outstanding con contributions to science. This ceremony is being webcast live so hello to everyone out there in the virtual audience. And we're very happy to have all of you here as well as this group in the auditorium. Now nomination details for awards that we will present next year are available on our website and nominations will be accepted until October 2nd. Remember, no one can win an award unless they are nominated. So you will all be sitting out there listening to these things and saying, oh, I know someone that I think is just as deserving. Well, write a nomination. And I'll also tell you, not all our awards are given every year. Some awards are given um, you know, every other year or every few years. So if you're sitting out there today and you say, oh, but there's no award in my field, check the web because there probably is an award in your field. It just wasn't being given this year. Now, it's my uh, pleasure to announce that the National Academy of Sciences has established the Robert A. Hicks Fund to support women in science. Ben Hicken chose the Academy as the beneficiary of a bequest from his uncle, Robert Hicks, in whose name the um, fund is uh, dedicated. Ben, I know you're here today with your wife, Jane, and son, Jeb. Please, can you stand to be recognized? We would love to recognize you. Anyway, we are deeply appreciative of your gift. I would also like to acknowledge that the several award donors have joined us today. Molly James, who is the granddaughter of Robert L. James. She is also a PhD candidate in oceanography at UConn. Um, so uh, Molly, are you here? Uh, yes, there she is. Molly, thank you, thank you. Uh, we so appreciate the generosity of your family. And also Sarah Moon Chapitan, uh, who's di di executive director of the FFAR Foundation, which is um, for uh, food and agricultural research. Um, I know she's here with us today. Liz Brown, who's uh, executive director of the Richard Lowry, Low Lounsbury Foundation is here. And Amy Cheng Vollmer, who's representing the donors of the Selman A. Waxman Award in Microbiology. And I know that Amy's uh, with us as well. We truly appreciate your continued support for these awards uh, that help us honor the best and brightest in science. Now first up are the Cazzarelli Prizes. These prizes are named in honor of a long-serving uh, editor of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Nicholas Cazzarelli. The prizes are awarded annually to six different research teams whose PNAS articles have made outstanding contributions to their fields. The papers represent and are chosen by people who are in the six different academy classes. So first I'll talk uh, about the class one uh, Casarelli Prize in physical and mathematical sciences. And the name of the paper is Exploring the Ancient Chemistry of Mercury. And the authors of this study analyzed Greek, Latin, and Syria um, uh, texts in alchemy from the first to the fourth century uh, before the Christian era and replicated historical methods for the extraction of mercury from cinnabar ore. Translating uh, alchemical lore into the language of chemistry, the study provides insight into the early history of chemistry as a discipline. So congratulations to that team. Um, the second uh, awardee for the Cazzarelli Prize is in class two, the biological sciences. 
And the name of the paper is SOX-8 Remodels the Cranial Ectoderm to Generate the Ear. I love that title. In this study, the authors explore, explored the elusive genetic mechanisms that form the vertebrate ear. Analyzing gene expression using molecular biology techniques in chick embryos, the authors found that a gene switch called SOX8 plays a crucial role in ear structure formation very early in embryonic development. So congratulations to that team. In class three, which is engineering and applied science, the paper is called Twisting for Soft Intelligent Autonomous Robot in Unstructured Environments. The authors of this study engineered a soft robot composed of a twisted ribbon of liquid crystal elastomer that can autonomously roll across unstructured environments. And you see uh, a picture here. It can navigate obstacles and even navigate ma mazes. The study demonstrates the potential benefits of incorporating embodied intelligence into soft robots. So congratulations to that team. Next for class four, biomedical sciences, it's for the paper in vivo real-time imaging reveals megalin as the aminoglycoside uh, gentamicin transporter into cochlea whose inhibition is autoprotective. And aminoglycoside antibiotics are used to treat bacterial infections, but these antibiotics can cause hearing loss by damaging the sensory hair cells in the cochlea. The authors of this study show how these antibiotics reach cochlear hair cells, and they also identified a protein inhibitor that can reduce antibiotic-induced uh, hearing loss. And for many of us who are slowly losing our hearing, I'm sure we're very interested in that one. Okay, so congratulations to that. Um, class five, behavioral and social sciences. Uh, the paper that is being honored today is called Half of U.S. Population Exposed to Adverse Lead Levels in Early Childhood. And I love having a name for a paper that reveals the bottom line just by reading the title. The authors of this study combine census data leaded gasoline consumption statistics, and a national survey to estimate early life lead exposure for the U.S. population in 2015. At that time, more than 54% of the population had childhood blood lead le levels above the threshold for clinical concern, resulting in a loss of more than, get this, 824 million IQ points. So, congratulations to that team. <laughs> Class six, Applied Biological, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences, and it's for the paper, Pharmaceutical Pollution of the World's Rivers. To quantify the extent of pharmaceutical pollution of rivers worldwide, the authors of this study sampled more than 250 rivers in 104 countries. And these countries represent um, the environmental impact of 471 million people who are in these uh, watersheds. The highest levels of pharmaceutical pollution were observed in sub-Saharan Africa, Southern Asia, and South America. So congratulations to the authors of this report. Okay, so on now to the uh, Science Awards for 2023. First up is the Alexander Agassi Medal, and it's awarded to Kirk Bryan Jr. of NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory at Princeton University. And he is being cited for his pioneering and visionary scientific research with ocean and climate models, for establishing their physical and numerical foundations and applications, for deep insights that advance the frontiers of understanding of the ocean's role in Earth climate, and for decades of generous mentoring of ocean and climate scientists worldwide. 
Unfortunately, Kirk is unable to be with us today. I heard some rumor about a broken leg, maybe? Yes, right. So um, Inez Fung, who was chair of the selection committee, will accept the award on his behalf. So Inez, thank you. Hello, Kirk. Uh, congratulations. We re really wish you were here. Uh, Kirk writes, it was inevitable that numerical models of ocean circulation would be developed after the success of numerical weather forecasting. Like any technical innovation, many people were involved at the beginning and later on as the early models were refined in particular, Mike Cox and Bert Sempner. A proposal by John von Neumann and Jewel Charney and the foresight of Captain Rickendell Durfer and Harry Wexler of the Weather Bureau led to the creation of our laboratory led by Joe Smagorinsky. This laboratory provided an ideal place in the 1960s to develop an ocean model. Only in the 1970s did the issue of climate change create an urgency for a combined ocean atmosphere climate models. Today we all talk about climate change. The ocean absorbs not over 90% of the heat from the greenhouse gases. And Kirk developed the first model in 1967. And the model with Mike Cox was called the Modular Ocean Model, nicknamed MOM. And MOM has gone on now, uh, it's the first model, and now, now there's POP, the Parallel Ocean Program. And so <laughs> Kirk has led the way into how we think about the ocean's role in the climate, in the climate system. Congratulations, Kirk. We wish you were here. Yeah. Thank you so much, Inez. Um, next up is the Arktowski Medal. It's awarded to David J. McComas of Princeton University. And he's being cited for his seminal contributions through innovative mission and instrumentation development that have benefited and supported the entire scientific community and for groundbreaking observations, analysis, and discovery of fundamental physics of the heliosphere and the very local interstellar medium, the solar wind and the Earth's and other planetary magnetospheres. I believe Dr. McComas is here to accept his medal. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. McNutt and the National Academy of Sciences. And thank you to the Arkowski family that made this wonderful honor possible. I have been extremely fortunate to spend my career working with the finest space scientists, engineers, technicians, administrators, and other team members from institutions across the country and around the world. Together, we have invented new space instrumentation and missions, measured phenomena never previously observed, flown spacecraft to places never before explored, explored and discovered many new secrets of the universe. I accept this medal on behalf of all of the outstanding colleagues and team members that I have had the great privilege to work with. Finally, thank you to my loving wife, Marnie Fector, and my three wonderful sons, Random, Cohen, and Orion. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, David. Uh, next up is the Arthur L. Day Prize, which is also associated with a lecture and it's awarded to Jerry Mitrovica of Harvard University for his fundamental contributions to understanding the geophysical controls on global sea level variations and their impacts on human societies past and present. And Jerry's here to accept his award. Well, receiving this award from President McNutt is a particular honor because Professor McNutt's work on the Pacific Superswell served as a foundation for my graduate work on what I call vertical plate tectonics, but is now considered or named dynamic topography. And being in this hall with all of you at the National Climatic Academy uh, gives me a chance to thank people who are members of the Academy who have been important not only in my research but also in my life. I can think of Paul Hoffman, the great geologist who championed the work of a young graduate student without ever having met him. 
or Jim Zakos and Lee Kump. Lee is here, just elected this year. These earth historians extraordinaire who taught me all of these lessons in earth history that will last a lifetime and also taught me something quite important these days, which is to, that to be intellectually challenged, to be pushed, is to be intellectually deepened. Um, Michael Manga for sh uh, showing me that simple physical models can provide incredible insight into the most complex earth systems. And finally, Maureen Raymond, Mo, I hope, I'm not sure if she's here, but who took me through an incredible guided tour of the Ice Age and wasn't really upset when, after describing something to me, I asked her, well, when was the Pliocene anyway? I had no <laughs> idea. Right? Um, some people stand, well, it's a cliche to say that some people stand on the shoulders of giants, but I feel that I've also been lucky enough to walk with those giants as well. And that luck extends to my graduate students. I've had an incredible number of them that have been successful. Jackie Elsterman, Harriet Lau. I really feel I want to mention them, right? Uh, Tamara Pico, Natalia Gomez, Jessica Kreveling. They've made every day of my scientific discoveries uh, a joy, something that I hold uh, dear. I think the one enduring... The one final important thing that perhaps my group has shown over the years is that solid earth geophysics is as important to the study as climate as the physics and chemistry of the oceans and atmospheres. So I thank the Arthur L. Day Committee for this singular honor, for the National Academy for allowing me a moment to thank all of the people responsible for it. Thank you. Wonderful, Jerry, and congratulations. Next up is the James Prize in Science and Technology Integration. It's being awarded to Harold Hess of Howard Hughes Medical Institute and Genalia Research Campus for his revolutionary advancements in multiple methodologies from creating states of matter close to absolute zero to imaging molecules and cells below the diffraction limit to imaging subcellular architectures with isotropic resolution across entire tissues. His technologies have been adopted by hundreds of physicists and biologists to advance their fields in many different ways. So, Harold, floor is yours. Thank you. It's a deep honor to be the recipient of the James Prize. Since the prize seeks to recognize and promote the integration of diverse fields of science and technology, I would like to share how that was achieved. For me, it didn't start with a vision followed by cross-disciplinary team building, but rather by just following curiosity and integrating oneself into multiple different jobs and fields, and then repeatedly abandoning abandoning such comfort zones to be reborn into new spaces across academia, industry, and eventually into unemployment, along with my colleague, Eric Betzik. This path is risky, but it's also empowering. Uh, recently, it enabled me to bring experiences from solid state, atomic physics, semiconductor, hard disk drive industry, and semiconductor industry to real new biological details by innovating in optical and electron microscopy. For this, critical credit and my gratitude goes to the many people and institutions like Janelia who allow one to be reborn into new challenges. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Okay, next up is the Michael and Sheila Held Prize. It's being awarded to Thomas Fiddick of the California Institute of Technology and the Weizmann Institute of Science for his breakthroughs in quantum complexity and quantum cryptography that led to the proof that the class of languages in which membership may be established by quantum multiprover interactive proof systems is equal to the class of recursively enumerable languages. And I believe he is... Here, yes, uh, Dr. Vidic, we would love to hear from you. Thank you, uh, Dr. McNutt. 
And I would like to first thank uh, my nominators and the award committee and the National Academy of Science uh, for this award. So I'm very honored uh, to be a recip recipient of the prize, uh, and I find myself very lucky. Uh, lucky to be here, and more importantly, lucky to have had the opportunity to work over the years on such deep and beautiful problems uh, with such kind and talented colleagues. For this, I would like to thank, um, first of all, my parents, uh, who equipped me with uh, wings, uh, and second of all, my academic mentors, uh, Julia Kempe and Umesh Vazirani, for teaching me uh, how to use those wings and picking me up and showing me the way whenever I got lost, uh, which, uh, which tends to happen uh, quite often. Uh, and, and finally, and uh, most importantly, I want to uh, thank my, my wonderful close collaborators uh, for their company and their work that this award recognizes. And I particularly want to name uh, Anand Natarayan, uh, Henry Yuen, Zheng Feng Ji, Joe Fitzsimmons, and uh, John Wright. Um, so thank you. Next, we have the NAS Award for Chemistry in Service to Society, and it's awarded to Kay Jung Timken of the Chevron Technical Center. She is being honored for her contributions to the development of the ionic liquid-based isoalkyl technology that can be applied to hundreds of plants worldwide to reduce the industrial process hazard of fuel production. And she's here to accept the award. It is my privilege to receive this award in service to uh, society. Uh, we are honored to receiving the recognition from National Academy to giving us such an award that we are contributing to the awareness of our society. Our project started from simple discovery of novel catalytic process using ionic liquid catalysts about 20 years ago. It was a eureka moment. Since then, the, for the research and development, I've been work, I have an amazing fortune of working great minds. I have to say that over uh, easily a thousand people were involved in converting that discovery into a commercial reality. And of the final product, ISOARC technology, we are all very proud. It will lower the um, environmental impact of fuels manufacturing that 100 million barrels are produced each day. So it, that impact lowering makes big, significant differences and also improve the safety of the refinery operations. Mm -hmm. So I would like to thank our company for the long-term commitment to make this technology development possible. Finally, I want to thank my family and friends for their support and love Without that, I was not able to achieve where we are. And I particularly thank my husband, who is in this audience, who really helped me all the way through. And I want also want to uh, thank you for express to all of you. Thank you. The NAS Award for Scientific Discovery is awarded to Kayvon M. Shokat of the University of California, San Francisco. He is being honored for his breakthrough using innovative chemical biology approaches leading to the discovery of the first drugs against the common oncogene, KRAS, a target previously considered undruggable. So, Kayvon. Thank you. Thank you very much for this award. I want to thank uh, the nominators and the committee for selecting me. It's a, it's a real honor. I particularly want to thank my uh, graduate students and postdocs who bring their enthusiasm to the lab every day and embrace the uncertainty we have in uh, all the projects we pursue. Um, for this particular project, I really want to thank my colleague Frank McCormick uh, for introducing me to the world of RAS and uh, encouraging us to work on it for so many years, even before we took a stab at it. Uh, and then also my colleague uh, Jim Wells, who brought a, a particular screening technology that we applied to the problem. Uh, and then the two people that really worked on the project, John Ostrom and Ulf Peters, who started on the project when everybody told us it would really be uh, impossible. So I want to thank them all. 
Um, I want to thank my parents for encouraging my curiosity from a very early age. Uh, and lastly, I want to thank my wife, Deborah, who's here uh, for over uh, four decades of advice and encouragement. And uh, what I've learned over that time is that our advice is always right, even if it's not the easiest to follow. But over and over again, it's turned out to be correct. So thank you. The NAS Award for the Industrial Application of Science is presented this year in the field of material science. And we are uh, rewarding or awarding this uh, award to Jeffrey W. Coates of Cornell University. He's being honored for his discovery of efficient synthetic processes to make important high performance materials from biorenewable sources, for his design of new polymeric materials for safe and practical energy conversion and storage applications, and for his invention of viable approaches for the recycling of the world's plastic waste. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dr. McNutt, for the very kind words. Um, it's a really tremendous honor uh, to receive this award. I'd like to thank my nominators, um, obviously the selection committee and the academy for this award. Um, families first, I'd like to thank my family for all their support over the years. Uh, my wife and daughter are here today, um, and it's really great to have their support. Um, I would like to thank my um, entire research group, a couple hundred people over the years have um, done the science that is largely the basis for this award. Um, four that I would like to point out in general are Scott Allen, Christina Hugar, and Christina ironically is up there on the left um, with the green sweater, um, Gabby Rodriguez and Tingwei Lin, and they are um, partners in co-founding uh, three companies over the years that commercialize um, chemistries out of my group. So um, I'd like to conclude by thanking um, a former mentor, uh, Bob Grubbs, um, Nobel Prize in, in 2005, member of the Academy. Um, unfortunately, passed away a, a little over a year ago, uh, but he was always an amazing mentor. And while I was a postdoc in the mid-90s with him at Caltech, um, he started a company, and at the time I thought that was kind of unusual because he was a very academic, um, scholarly scientist. And I asked him, you know, why, why did you decide to start this company? And he said, you know, Jeff, I, I came up with these technologies that I thought could be of great use to society, and some of these big companies, just there's too big of a technological gap between the science I've developed and, and products that are going to benefit the world. And he said, I, I felt like if I didn't start these companies and kind of show these companies that the, these projects had, had reality, that they would never be used. And so I'd like to um, acknowledge him for his um, wisdom. So thank you again for the honor, and I um, appreciate it. The NAS Award in Chemical Sciences is awarded to Krzysztof Mediaszewski of Carnegie Mellon University for development of atom transfer radical polymerization and other living polymerization methods to prepare polymers with precisely controlled and complex architecture for advanced applications ranging from super soft materials to organic, inorganic hybrids and bioconjugates. And Christoph is here to accept his award. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. McNatt, for the kind introduction and the correct pronunciation of my last name. <laughs> and uh, I feel extremely honored and humbled by this uh, very special recognition but also I realize that this award recognizes hundreds or maybe thousands of polymer chemists working in a field of well-defined polymers. These polymers are used for advanced materials, whether it is biomedicine or energy or environment. But more precisely, we work with the macromolecular engineering, which in fact is a design and then very precise preparation, and finally characterization of tailor-made polymers. These polymers have controlled size, shape, composition, functionality, and in some sense, 
they resemble natural proteins and nucleic acids. So they can self-assemble. They sometimes can self-heal or self-repair. Often they respond to external stimuli. They can contract or expand like our muscles. They also can have a sometimes super tough, but sometimes super soft properties like tissue. And eventually, we also think about degrading these polymers back to monomers. So this is really something which can help alleviate some problems, environmental problems with polymers, when we go back to monomers and repolymerize them again. But I must acknowledge really contributions of many collaborators and over 200 graduate students, undergrads and postdocs who through very creative and passionate work and original work develop atom transfer radical polymerization. But finally, my thanks go to my family for their unconditional support, but also tolerating my endless hours, not only during weeks, but during weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. So thank you very much. The NAS Award in Molecular Biology is awarded to Jason S. McClellan of the University of Texas at Austin for his pioneering work in designing a stabilized form of virus surface proteins that induce the best humoral immune responses, which he supported with atomic resolution structures. These efforts led directly to multiple SARS-CoV-2 and long-sought RSV vaccines and the promise of success against an array of additional pathogens. So, Jason. All right, thank you very much, the warm reception. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my nominator and mentor, Barney Graham, who have been working uh, with uh, since the beginning of RSV and on all the COVID work. Uh, other mentors, Peter Kwong, uh, Daniel Leahy, my PhD advisor, who's just been a, a tremendous supporter. You know, as uh, Dr. M mentioned, none of these awards are possible without people willing to do all the nominations and that, that hard work, so I'd like to thank them. I'd like to thank uh, all of my collaborators, uh, my trainees, grad students, postdocs, the staff who all make this possible, who do all the work. I'd like to thank my family, my wife Janelle, son Gavin, and daughter Kaya, who are in attendance and dressed up, so be sure to <laughs> check them out, they're looking spiffy. I'd like to thank my parents, who may have figured out the, the streaming, so uh, parents, if you're watching, thanks so much for, for all you did when I was young. Uh, in terms of the science, it's just been a ex really exciting time for structure-based vaccine design. You know, the stabilized antigens we used are found in all COVID-19 vaccines authorized for use uh, in the United States. The RSV stabilized F proteins that we created uh, should be uh, approved by the FDA this month, poss possibly as soon as this week. With new advances in structural biology, machine learning, protein engineering, I think we're going to see a decade of new vaccines. Uh, we have a lot of stuff in the pipeline, so stay tuned. Thank you. The NAS, NAS Prize in Food and Agricultural Sciences is awarded to Wai Jun Zhao of the University of California, Davis, for his innovative multidisciplinary approach to animal and poultry genome research leading to improved global food security through genetic enhancement of poultry health and production efficiencies. Dr. Zhao. Thank you. I'm really honored to receive the, this prize from National Academy of Sciences. I first like to acknowledge uh, the nominators and the selection committee for their consideration for this tremendous honor. Thanks the uh, Foundation of the Food and Agricultural Sciences and Bill Manita Gates Foundation for set up this prize. And I'm so grateful my research has been really supported by many funders, including USAID, NIFA, and FAR, to uh, uh, support my scientific pursuits. 
Science is really a team sport. I have so many people I need to thank. So first, I like to thank my academic mentor, Dr. Sunaman, who is here today. So she really taught me how to do in the science and、uh, both professional and personal levels. I remember when I came to the U.S. about 25 years ago, I barely speak English and understand English, and she's so such a patient and so supportive. I also like to thank、uh, uh, my colleague、uh, Harris Newing also here,、uh, the colleague also、uh, Tom Spencer also here. Thanks for their support. And I can extend to my heartfelt、uh, gratitude to the graduate student, postdoc, and scientists、uh, working my lab,、uh, you know, for their dedication and hard work. And many of the colleagues、uh, in the U.S. and、uh, many of the other countries, particularly the Feed the Future Innovation App,、uh, genomics to improve poultry. I also like to dedicate、uh, specially to this、uh, prize to my wife. Nina Zhou is here, and my son Jimmy Zhou also is here for their inspiration and also,、uh, you know, endless of support for many years.、Uh, and then, last but not least, I like to thank、uh, my sisters and my sister-in-law in China, who have carried much of the burden in China, so I can、mm. stay here, stand here to accepting this prize.、Mm. A culture really is the backbone of our society. The challenges we face from、uh, feeding the growing population, particularly the African continent, and to、uh, mitigate、uh, the impact of、uh, climate change and disease outbreaks,、uh, require collective effort. Animal genome research has the power to shape the future of our planet, from developing the new sustainable genetic method to improve access to nutrients food for all. I really believe that science has the potential to transform life of the many of the people. I'm committed to use my platform to continue inspire next generation scientists to join this critical mission. Once again, thank you all. The. Cradle Research Award is awarded to Hong Kui Zeng of the Allen Institute for Brain Science for her extraordinary contributions to our understanding of cell types and connections in the mammalian brain, and her development of systems neuroscience tools and data that are freely available to the research community. Unfortunately, she's unable to be with us today, but、uh, Amita Singhal. Uh, chair of the selection committee is going to accept the award on her behalf. Congratulations to Hong Kui Zhang, who sent the following acceptance remarks. I want to thank the Academy for this tremendous honor. I am deeply humbled to join the ranks of the past Pradell awardees, whom I admire so much. This award is a recognition of my numerous colleagues at the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Who jointly pioneered the team science and open science approach to create foundational data, tools, and knowledge to accelerate our understanding of the cellular and circuit basis of brain function? In particular, I thank Allen Institute founder Paul Allen for his vision and support, and Allen John Allen Jones, our institute leader for 18 years, for entrusting me with extraordinary leadership opportunities over the years. I am also eternally grateful to my parents,、uh, my partner, my two amazing children, for the boundless love and joy they have given me. I dedicate this award to my father, who is fighting for his life now.、Mm -hmm. Stay strong, Dad. Congratulations again to Hong Kui for showing us how major breakthroughs can be made through team science. Thank you. I think we can certainly understand why she's not with us today. The Richard Lounsbury Award is awarded to Michelle Monge of the Stanford School of Medicine for her groundbreaking discoveries that neuronal activity promotes adaptive myelination, important for cognition, and that neuronal activity drives malignant glioma progression 
through neuron to glioma synapses and paracrine factors. These contributions have elucidated new perspectives in neuroscience and pioneered the field of cancer neuroscience. Uh, Michelle? It is an enormous honor to receive the Lounsbury Award. I am deeply grateful to the National Academy, to the Selection Committee, to the Lounsbury family, and grateful to so many who have been with me on my scientific journey thus far. To my mother for her unwavering encouragement, even and perhaps especially when the path forward was the least clear. To my husband, Carl, and our wonderful children, Cole, Alexander, Hudson, Emma, and Sophie, who have been my all-time favorite neurodevelopmental biology projects <laughs> <laughs> for their support and inspiration. To my mentors, including Kathleen Sussman, Theo Palmer, and Philip Beachy, who taught me an approach to seeking knowledge that combines scientific rigor and joyful curiosity in equal measures. To my brilliant students and collaborators, who were brave enough to travel with me into uncharted waters, often at the intersections of disciplines. And to my patients, whose neurological diseases demand answers to questions that can only be addressed through fundamental neurobiology. It is these questions that will continue to chart our path of basic inquiry. Thank you. The Selma A. Waxman Award in Microbiology is awarded to Nancy Moran of the University of Texas at Austin for her outstanding achievements that have brought about a major advance in the field of microbiology, in particular evolution, ecology, genomics, and molecular mechanisms of host microbe symbiotic associations. Based on her discoveries, Nancy Moran developed general and far-reaching principles in the microbial genome evolution. Nancy. Thank you, Marcia. Um, it's such an honor and actually a surprise <laughs> to mm -hmm. receive the Voxman Award. Um, it's also humbling knowing just it's a huge field and there's so many amazing scientists in this field who've made astonishing discoveries over the last couple of decades, we've suddenly realized that microbes actually rule the world, the oceans, the land, and even our own guts. So we have many people to thank, um, really people who deserve more credit than me. These include wonderful colleagues in the field of symbiosis, symbiotic interactions between microbes and plants, animals, fungi, um, all kinds of organisms. We've learned that these are really important, really, to the functioning of all life on Earth. And these are people who are from all, all around the world. Um, so we have a community studying these things that's very inclusive and very inviting, and there's a lot of diverse people um, contributing to this field. I also thank the amazing students and postdocs who've worked with me over the years. I can't name them all without going way over my time limit, but there's really a lot of wonderful people who now are out with their own independent labs investigating different areas in, um, related to microbial interactions with hosts. And we shared this excitement of ex exploring these whole new worlds. The former me would have been especially surprised um, at this award as I didn't start out in microbiology. I started out studying bugs, but they were the kind with six legs. And, and so I moved into this. And I really owe two people in particular who helped me. One of them is Paul Bauman, a fantastic scientist with limitless curiosity, the first person who introduced me to bacteria. I still remember the phone call where he excitedly was telling me about this system that he wanted to work on with me and it really changed my whole direction. And then most of all, I thank Howard Ackman, my husband who's here today, who's taught me more than anyone else and shared my life, including my scientific life and my whole life for the last 25 years. So thank you all. We have two Trolland Research Awards to present. The first Trollin Award is awarded to Tim Bushman of Princeton University 
for his groundbreaking insights into the neural mechanisms of cognitive control. By combining cutting-edge experimental and theoretical approaches, his work has provided a deeper understanding of how the dynamic interactions of neuronal populations support working memory, attention, and goal-directed behavior. Tim. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the Academy and the Selection Committee uh, for this honor. Uh, so many of my scientific heroes over the years have won the Trollin Award, and so it's deeply meaningful and, and honestly humbling uh, to, to receive this award this year. Uh, of course, like all of science, uh, my research is not really my own, but is really the result of many. Uh, I'd like to thank my wife, Sarah, uh, who has been my closest collaborator and greatest inspiration. Uh, thank you to my parents and my family, including my, my children, Ryan and Madeline, uh, whose curiosity and wonder for the world have really fueled my passion for science. Thank you to my mentors, both official and unofficial, whose guidance has been pivotal in science and shaping my research. And I'd like to especially thank my graduate advisor, Earl Miller, who uh, creativity, whose creativity and insight really opened up the door uh, for studying the highest forms of cognition. And lastly, I'd like to thank uh, many of my co collaborators and colleagues at, at Princeton, and especially my, my lab members, my graduate students and postdocs, uh, really for the opportunity to do science together. Thank you. The second Trolland Award is awarded to Catherine Hartley of New York University for her pioneering contributions to the understanding of the adolescent mind and brain, including identifying developmental shifts in value-driven, goal-directed, and habitual behaviors, and changes in brain systems supporting emotional learning and memory that form adolescent vulnerability to psychopathology. So, Catherine. Thank you. It's a tremendous honor to receive this award. I'd like to begin by thanking the many brilliant and generous academic mem uh, mentors who have shaped my scientific trajectory, and in particular, Liz Phelps and BJ Casey, whose training, support, and wonderful example have been so influential to my career. I'd like to thank my colleagues and collaborators whose excellence and creativity challenge and inspire me. I'd like to thank my friends and family for their love and support, and particularly my sons, Solomon and Elias. Solomon's here today. Uh, you remind me daily of how truly remarkable the process of human development is. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank the members of my lab, past and present. It's really their excellent work that's being honored with this award today. I'm fortunate to work with such talented scientists whose curiosity and insight take our work in new directions and whose kindness and camaraderie make the daily practice of doing science such a delight. Thank you. Wonderful. And last but certainly not least, is the National Academy of Sciences Public Welfare Medal our highest honor. The awardee will be introduced by Susan Wessler, the Academy's Home Secretary. So to sort of explain why I'm taking a little longer, the introduction uh, introducer has a little bit more time and the recipient has a little more time than the prior awards. So the, the 2023 National Academy of Science Public Welfare Medal is awarded to Freeman A. Rabowski, the third mathematician, educator, mentor, and higher education advocate. The Public Welfare Ma Medal was established in 1914 is the highest honor the National Academy, uh, of the National Academy and is presented annually by the Council of the Academy in recognition of distinguished contributions in the application of science to the public welfare. The citation for uh, Freeman Rabowski reads as follows. For his outstanding leadership 
in transforming U.S. science education and increasing cultural diversity within the science workforce. So I'm going to briefly uh, present a little bit of his biography, um, a little bit about awards, and uh, just uh, a few interesting quotes from him, at least quotes I think are interesting, from him and from a few of his uh, letters in support of his uh, nomination. So he was born in Birmingham, Alabama, graduated from Hampton Institute with highest honors in mathematics. He received his master's in mathematics and PhD in higher education administration slash statistics from the U University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. He served first as provost of UMBC, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, in 1987, and then as president of UMBC from 1992 to last year, 2022. He's received numerous, numerous awards and honors. I'm just going to highlight four. He holds honorary degrees from more than 45 institutions. Wow. He chaired the National Academies Committee that produced the 2011 report Expanding Underrepresented Minority Partic Participation, America's Science and Technology Talent at the Crossroads. He was named in 2012 by President Obama to chair the President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. And in 2022, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering for, quote, development of a national educational model for students from diverse backgrounds to excel in engineering and science. So I picked out two parts of his biography just to just expand a little bit. First, um, and some of these come from interviews that he has, he has given, the question was what made him pivot at the University of Indiana uh, from, not Indiana, Illinois, I apologize for that. Uh, what made him pivot from the universe, uh, pivot from math, where he got his master's, to higher education, where he got his PhD? His answer to that is, I had gotten a master's degree in mathematics, and I really enjoyed abstract algebra, but I had no one to talk to. Nobody would work with me in groups. I was usually the only black in the class. Most importantly, I wanted to be able to talk about the work. I began seeing that a lot of graduate students were having problems with their quantitative courses across the social sciences. I was especially interested in looking at how statistics could be used in explaining different challenges and trends in higher education. He goes on to say, my focus for years has been on evaluation, quantitative and qualitative evaluation. So all my research over the past 40 years has focused heavily on STEM education and evaluation of programs and the use of statistics. Why did he go to UMBC? UMBC was founded in 1966, where he served, and he served as the first president, as I said before, for, for half, almost half of the time. Um, he, um, he answered in, in, in answer to the question why UMBC, he said, we were the first campus founded in our state that would accept students of all races. Every other university, typically in the South in general, was either for blacks or whites. So the other thing, I'm going to just expand on the program that he's received so much um, uh, attention for. Uh, the Meyerhoff Scholars Program was established in 1989 and co-founded by Dr. Rabowski and Robert and Jane Meyerhoff. The program is designed to prepare underrepresented students for academic careers in STEM disciplines. It has served as a model for developing and supporting underrepresented students pursuing, pursuing careers in STEM. The expansion of the program first occurred in 2013 in order to determine if the model can be replicated at larger universities. And in this case, in 2013, there was a Chancellor's Science Scholarship at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and, and also the Millennial Scholars Program at Penn State University. In 2019, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative awarded $6.9 million to replicate the Meyerhoff Scholars Program at UCSD and UC Berkeley. In 2022, what I think is an amazing honor, Howard Hughes Medical Institute launched a 1.5 billion Freeman Rabowski Scholars Program for outstanding early career faculty committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And to quote one of his letter writers, 
So what once could be considered a boutique program has become the national model for how to attract, retain, and graduate very talented but underrepresented students into careers in science. What is the model? It rests on several simple ideas that there are immensely promising future scientists to be found everywhere. You just need to look for them. That they're flourishing in the program requires intense attention from faculty. And that it is critical to set high expectations as long as you provide the tools to meet them. Thus, Freeman has not only transformed UMBC, his model is also transforming the way the nation educates the next generation of underrepresented scientists, mathematicians, and engineers. And finishing up here, from an interview in Inside Higher Education, uh, Dr. Robowski was asked, how does your background in civil rights activism contribute to your leadership style or practices? His answer to that was, I heard Dr. King say at the Children's March in Birmingham when I was 12 that, quote, tomorrow could be better than today. All the things we saw as children, going to schools that didn't have resources, being given torn up books from the white schools, the world didn't have to remain that way. The day might come when we could go and sit at the table in a restaurant rather than going through a side door to pick something up. His message gave me hope and open my mind to the possibilities that America could be far better than it was at that time. And the final thing one of his letter writers wrote, he has been able to demonstrate to the world that excellence and equity are not mutually exclusive, but mutually enhancing. I'm, I'm not going to look at Jackie and then I can stay. I'll bet you I'll be able to get through this. Uh, you know, so as you get older, you realize certain things. Uh, there was a time in my life when, when I uh, would, would be getting an award and I'd think about my parents who've gone on and I would say, I wish they were here. I've now gotten to the point when I, when I actually feel that those people you love who go on somehow are still with you. And you feel them somehow with you. And so I, I first want to say how honored I am. I want to thank you, Sue, for that wonderful, heartfelt introduction. And you, Marsha, for, for all, wherever you are, thank you so much for this. And then I want to tell you that more than 50 years ago as a, a young 15-year-old college freshman thinking I was the smartest person in the world, and we got the first math test back, and I just knew I had the highest score, and I didn't. And... I began to realize, as we all do, we're never the smartest person in the world. Well, somehow, a young woman got that perfect score, and all the guys were very upset when she walked up, and I hollered out, I'm going to marry her one day, and I did. And Jackie, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much for True story, true story. And the message to my students is when you, when you can't beat them, marry them. Marry somebody smarter. It's, it's a true story. I am so honored to be here today um, because of the wonderful people who nominated me, who wrote the letters, because I want to thank the NAS Council for this. I realize just what it means. As a Southerner, people from the South were sending me notes saying, Freeman, you're in really high cotton today is the term that we use today, and I would like to make you laugh some uh, as I talk. But I'm also honored because of the wonderful people who received this medal, this medal before me, and you'll hear me mentioning some of their names as I talk, uh, and I will give some highlights of my, my written statement today without giving all of them. I am honored also because I have several of my wonderful friends and special people here with me today, and you'll hear me mentioning them as I go through this. Two of them I'll mention right now who are in philanthropy, and one of my talks, my points to Marsha is that we need to keep thinking about how we connect philanthropy and the, the national agencies and companies. And while I'll be mentioning someone who's like a sister to me later on, I want to mention someone who 
runs her foundation, who's the executive director, who's a, one of my students, uh, uh, Josh Michael, and then the head of North America, J.P. Morgan Chase Philanthropy. I'm really proud of two of my graduates who are called Sunheim Scholars, and then I'll be talking later about somebody from Duke, uh, and you'll hear about them. But I start with I. I. Robbie, one of the people who received this medal years ago, who in the 40s was a Nobel laureate in physics. Some of you know that name. He told the story of growing up in New York, and he said that when he was growing up, many of his friends' mothers would ask them at the end of a school day, what did you learn in school today? He said, not my Jewish mother. He said, my mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And the practice of encouraging his curiosity made him the thinker he became. And I am from a campus that loves asking good questions. And so I accept this award today on behalf of my colleagues and my thought partner, Mike Summers, is here, whom I'll talk about in a while, because we were constantly asking questions, questions having to do with how do we help more students to succeed, and questions about broadening participation in science and engineering. And, and you all recall the, the report rising above the, the gathering storm in Norm Augustine. Right after that report, four senators asked that another report, asked the National Academies to do another report that was mentioned earlier, in the Crossroads report that I chaired. And a member of the staff here, Peter Henderson, uh, directed the study. And it was a very special study that we worked on for a good while. And some of that work ended up being a part of policies at national agencies. And I was so impressed that I invited Peter to join me. And so for the past dozen or so years, he has worked with me on continuing to look at the data and to analyze what's happening with people of color in science and engineering. And I'll talk about that. What I can say is that just as we said that was a, we were at a crossroads in 2011, we are still at a crossroads both in our nation and in science. Interestingly enough, it was 55 years ago, just four miles from here at the cathedral, that Martin King gave his last sermon a few days before he was assassinated in, in 1968, assassinated this month. And he quoted another theologian and said something we've all heard before, that we shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. 30 years ago, the great historian Arthur Schlesinger said that the genius of America lies in its capacity to forge a single nation from people remarkably diverse in racial, religious, and ethnic origins. Those two quotes inspire me because what I know and what you know is that it will be our actions. It has been our actions, but even more so, it will have to be our actions that can bend that arc of history towards a nation that is both one and just. And the theme of my talk is that I have the hope that that can happen, even in times when things seem so divided and when people question the truth, and when people worry about whether or not science will continue to be accepted and respected the way it should be. And I tell my students, uh, when people say uh, that we've never been so divided, I always tell them to go back to the 60s, the 1960s or the 1860s. <laughs> and we get a sense that we've been here before, and somehow we come out of it. Interestingly enough, Marsha, you know that it's been three years, it's hard to believe, since we had the 75th anniversary of the convocation. Uh, and we talked about science, the end, endless frontier. And we all agreed, of course, that we are better as a society, that all of what has happened because of science. And yet we all agreed that there were ways in which we could be better. And you, Marsha, and colleagues, in writing that report, talked about this challenge that we face of finding ways of having a better mechanism for reducing the barriers to participation. We saw during COVID the lack of trust on the part of so many in our country, the need for more to be involved. And so on the one hand, we know we can make 
or progress. On the other hand, I always want to talk about that progress. As a child, that I only knew of one black scientist. His name was George Washington Carver, the peanut scientist, right? Sadly, that while there are many more, so many people still don't know the names of enough scientists, but we do know that in, 19, in, in 160 years ago, when this academy was founded, no one could have, could have possibly imagined that Marsha McNutt would be the president of the National Academy of Sciences. <laughs> Wasn't even a possibility, or that I would be getting this medal. So let us not forget the progress that has been made. And then John Holdren, in accepting the award last year, talked about the fact that we must continue to tell the truth. The challenge we face, if we look at it, is that when the Veneva Bush report was done in the 40s, only 5% of Americans had graduated from college. Today, we're up to 38%. The fact is that most people don't know the small percentage in the 1960s. You may not know this, but only 10% of Americans had graduated from college in the 60s. And when I break it down, everything at that time was broken down between black and white. Um, yeah, there were only 3%, not quite 4% of blacks, who graduated, but only 11% of whites had graduated from college in the 60s. And when I talk about the need for culture change, I'm talking about what Eric Weiner says in his book, The Geography of Bliss, that somehow he says that culture is the sea we swim in, so all-consuming that we fail to recognize it until we step out of it and look back at ourselves. We did that as we looked at the convocation. We saw what was good and what we needed to work on. We do it today. And when we think about higher education, you may not know this. Everybody is very positive about the GI Bill. But do you know, who do you think fought the GI Bill in the 40s? Who was it that said, if you allow those veterans into our colleges and universities, those institutions will become academic hobo jungles? Who do you think said that? Anybody? Now, I know the scientists know how to be less than risk adverse. So who said it? Any suggestions? College presidents. In the 40s, and the presidents of the most prestigious. Now, they were not, they were good people, but they just thought that if you were not from wealth, you should not be going to college. That was the culture in America. And FDR was called an enemy to his class. That was the thinking in the 40s. But what happened? We had the legislation, we had the civil rights movement, and all of a sudden you had people, you had the Higher Education Act of 1965. You had the, the Voting Rights Act in 65, the, the Civil Rights Act in 64, Higher Education, Voting Rights 65. And all of a sudden, by the early 70s with the Pell Grant, more people were going to college. And so all of a sudden you had many more people going. And people saw with the GI Bill, two million veterans go to college in the 40s, and they saw regular people could go to college. We saw science making a difference. Why do I tell you this? Just as we saw now, we didn't have as many minorities, not as many women, but we began to have them. I would say the same thing in science. That right now, when people think of a scientist, we, we tend to still think of a guy, a man. We are beginning to think of more women. The, I chaired the uh, direct that our PI was PI on our advanced program. I think the NSF program for women is one of those changing culture programs that we need to do more with for women and for people of color. But what I would say to you is, when thinking about changing culture, we still accept the idea that more than half the people who start college don't graduate. Think about it. Literally, we say it's a 60% graduation rate after, 60, 60, uh, after six years, but the fact is that well over half of all universities have graduation rates well below 45%. The largest and richest will have 90% small liberal arts colleges, but most students are in institutions where more than half will not graduate. Imagine if we said that the success rates of hospitals was under 50%. Well, if I go to a hospital, I've got a half, 50% chance of living out of there. It, we would say it was unacceptable. Why do I say all of that? We know we need to do better in graduating students, number one. And then it's because of the graduation rates in general that we can then be talking about those who go on in science. But you have to start first with the graduation rates in general. And what can we say? And this is where the Crossroads Report was very important because what it showed was that literally more than half the students who start in science and engineering will leave it. We still call the first year or two of science weed out courses. And while NSF has helped in some cases, Francis here, we worked on that on the weed out courses and course redesign, Karen. Uh, we also know that that's pockets, in pockets around the country. We still need to change the culture in many institutions to help more students to succeed there. 
But let's go back for one moment, the K through 12. The issue, and, and what the report showed was we need to do much more with pre-K through 12, we know that, and then look at undergrad, grad, and that. But I want to make one comment, and this is where I want to talk about two people who had a big question to ask. What can we do to strengthen K through 12, pre-K through 12, early childhood, and all the way up, particularly to middle school? And it was the late George Sherman and Betsy Sherman, who's here today, who made a big difference. They said to us, we want to make a difference. We want to see more children low-income children, black and Hispanic children, children in Baltimore City, doing better in math, in reading, starting with early childhood, but especially in those middle school years. What can we do? And it was based on that, and I want, I, and it really, and I want philanthropist uh, Betsy Sherman, I want you all to give a round of applause for what they did. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> and Josh was that one. And so we have, if you Google the Sherman Scholars Program, the Sherman STEAM Center, partnering with Northrop Grumman, and now we have these wonderful scholars who are math majors, math and science majors, teaching in middle schools. If you were to ask me one of the biggest challenges in our country, when we look at around the, around the country, every state but one went down in math scores in our country. We as a National Academy of Sciences have to be concerned about that. That it, it, when you talk about performance at next levels, think about pre-K through 12. And I'm saying, and one of the biggest challenges is that most teachers in that middle school level who are teaching algebra would not have had even one semester of calculus. That the level of, and the nightmare for most elementary school teachers is to have a parent who's a scientist or an engineer. <laughs> Because you're going to solve a problem in a different way from the teacher. And most teachers don't know but one way to, to solve that problem. They need more support. And so look at the Sherman Scholars Program as one approach of having much better prepared teachers for middle school. And also, though, and I was glad to see one of the, the topics, Marsha, about early childhood, the idea of having much stronger teachers at the early childhood level, including more strength, strength in math and science at those levels, and so think about that. And so the idea of thinking, rethinking what we can do at a national level in teacher preparation, especially given what we're seeing with math schools around the country. And then at the undergrad level, here's the one good news, that the Hispanic population has seen progress since our Crossroads report. They've have had substantial increases. They're up to about 17% of the students now graduating with bachelors in STEM. Unfortunately, the black scores are still at about 9%. It's been flat. For the PhD level, it's still under 3% for blacks, and for Hispanics, it's still under 4%. And at the faculty level, we're still between 2 and 4%. So we have to continue to talk about moving the needle and what it will take to do that. And so for most of you in most of your campuses, in most of your departments, there will be either no blacks, few Hispanics, or one or two at most. And the challenge we face is that more of the society will come from those populations. And if we want to have the trust, if we want to have the brain power, we're going to have to find ways of doing that. Our solution at UMBC had everything to do with wanting to grow our own and to find more people who could, most importantly, become researchers. Uh, it was another medalist, Bill Fahey, a dear friend, former CDC director, who said something that really spoke to me. He said, if you, if you want to solve a problem, you must start with the end in mind. What is it you're trying to accomplish? And our goal with the Meyerhoff program, starting with Bob Meyerhoff, who was concerned about black males. He and his wife had already worked with her alma mater, Goucher, to do some things involving women's education. But he said, everything I see on TV involving black males, is, if it's not about sports, it's about handcuffs and something negative. And I'd like to see what I could do with that group. He was an MIT graduate, uh, and he wanted, and we were having the problem that our students of color were not doing well. Uh, and um, black students represented 15 or 16 percent of our population. Our largest minority population is Asian. 60 percent of our students have at least one parent from another country. We are now research one. But the key is that our students of color were not doing well, but when we looked at the data, large numbers of students of all races were not doing well, except there were enough white students, the base was large enough, that the top group of students were doing well. You get my point? So we saw some students, but when you find a campus that has minority students doing well, of course you're going to find other groups doing well. 
And the challenge is to find a way of looking at what will work. Well, the Meyer program is just that. So if you look at either my TED Talk or the 60 Minutes piece, you'll see a lot of that. Bob Meyerhoff is now 99 years old, and he's still asking good questions. He's still asking me good questions. I'm hoping he's watching this right now. Uh, and like the Shermans, he has been, for he and his friend Rita Becker, constantly asking questions about our graduates. And so it's more than just being a philanthropist for the money. It's getting them involved in the issues and the questions to be asked. And most important, we knew we had made success, a lot of success, when uh, it was interesting enough that the Association for uh, the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, 10 years later, did a study that showed there were 66 undergrads black in the country in biochemistry and chemistry who had completed bachelor's degrees, 21 came from our campus. 21 of the 66, and they all went on to grad school. So we knew we had done something, and we really pushed the PhD first. For those students interested in medicine, we looked at those who were good enough to become MDPs. So we're the leading producer of African Americans who are going to get PhDs in the natural sciences and engineering, and the leading producer of of African Americans who are going to get MD PhDs. Give my colleagues a round of applause for that, would you? <laughs> Nobody has been more important to that area, than that issue, than Michael Summers. Are you here, Michael, somewhere? Michael Summers. Give Michael Summers a round of applause. He has been, and that's, that is the point I want to make. And he and, and Holly, who are both in that lab, Dr. and Dr. Summers working together, the key is that, as I say in my TED talk, it takes researchers to produce researchers. And that's what I want to say to this audience, that somehow when, when he goes to give a talk, he will only go if they want him to give two talks. One on his research on AIDS, on HIV, but the other on his work on inclusive excellence. So he can show his students and talk about what they're doing and the numbers who are doing all kinds of things. I want to give Howard Hughes a lot of respect and a lot of acknowledgement for working with us over the years, not only in his lab, but in replicating programs at Chapel Hill and Penn State years ago, with Michael leading that effort with others over there, and now with the other programs that are similar into replication um, around the country, uh, with a half billion dollars, different from the, the Rabowski Scholars Program. By the way, I am so honored by that, that $1.5 billion. The only odd part is, usually when something is named after somebody, uh, if they're not giving money, they're dead somehow, you know. <laughs> so it's a strange, it's a little strange, right? But it's really a great feeling. But, but the key for the Mike Summers attitude is that we need a cadre of excellent researchers who also come to know something about this work. Another person who knows about this work, and he's somewhere here, I hope, Bunny Graham. Is Bunny here somewhere still? Is Bunny here? Give him a round of applause. I, I know a lot about Bunny Graham. I want to say that. Because Bunny is the mentor to my, somebody whose name I have across my forehead. It's, it's Kismikia Corbett, who worked with him to lead, to co-lead the team. But they, it was Bunny's, they're all in that center there that, that Tony has and Fauci has. But the key is, and, and, and Kismikia and I, I sent her a picture uh, of the two of us, and this is the key that he has really worked to develop her career over the years. And Kismikia, who is now in the faculty at Harvard, first black woman to be involved in leading a team uh, in the creation of a vaccine in the world. Give Bonnie Graham a round of applause for being responsible for that. It's huge. It's huge. Now, here's the point I want to make. He could have been so egotistical to have taken all the credit for that. It would have been just as easy with the power, but he wanted to empower her. And that, so it's researchers to produce researchers, but it's also researchers who want to empower people different from themselves and to be human beings. That's what she says about him, that not only that he is excellent, and this is the same thing with Mike Summers, that he, they, they get to know their mentees not just as fellow scientists, but as human beings. And one of the challenges we face at the National Academy of Sciences, Marsha, we were talking about this, is that people need to know that we are people. I loved it when the scientists, the awardees, talked about their families or their children and human development, right? People need to hear those things because they think that scientists are robots. We need to understand that we have a sense of humanity at a time when artificial intelligence is what people are hearing. And that's what mentors who become champions, and there's that distinction. 
Mentors may, you listen to them, but these two people and others in this room are champions, and that's what we need. And so I want to commend Howard Hughes. And, and then the final that I want to mention has to do with, um, I want to mention the name of Sandy Williams, who was dean at Duke, telling me about how well my Mahoff scholars were doing at Duke at the time. And these were students in the MD-PhD program. And um, amazingly, um, he said, how do we get them to come on the faculty? Because we get some good students, and it has everything to do with intentionality. Intentionality. That we as a society must be uncomfortable when we are in a room and we all look the same. That our society, we must ask ourselves the question, do we begin to reflect our society? in how we look, and how we think, and are we, are we bringing in the different perspectives to get the best thoughts? You know, this, you know the sector of society I find most impressive when talking about inclusive excellence? It, believe it or not, it's the intelligence community. My campus is a major partner to the National Security Agency. And General Nakasani has worked very closely. We're one of the big partners in bringing in a lot of students in math and computational sciences. And he says, we want people, not just because of race, but people who come out of the inner city, people who come from suburban areas, because they solve problems differently. They solve problems differently based on their backgrounds. And he said, we need that if we're to defend our country. And I would argue to us that if we bring in people, and so Sandy understood that, and amazingly, four of those students who were there then are now on the faculty at Duke. And I, I'm really proud. I want to end with one. Interesting enough, Kismikia, who was one of the, the heroes with the, the heroes in Time Magazine with Barney, it's really wonderful. And got, she got the, um, the, the Ben Franklin Award there uh, in Philadelphia for 21 and then 22. Kafri Zarasa is here, and I'm really proud of him as a new member in the last year of the National Academy of Medicine, as a wonderful Howard Hughes investigator, and as of the last couple of months, he became a, he's in neuroscience and psychiatry. He became full professor at Duke. I want him to stand, and I want you to look into his face, and I want you to think this is science and medicine reimagined. Please stand, Kafri Zarasa. Give him a standing ovation and thank you very much. Give him a standing ovation and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much to Dr. Rabowski on that absolutely inspirational acceptance speech. So many terrific quotes in there. You know, there's many times when we give out an award and we hope that we have elevated the uh, visibility and the um, interest in that person's work. At this point, he is elevating the importance of our work. And I want to thank you for that very much. Mm. So at this point, I would love for all of our awardees for 2023 to stand up so we can give you one final thundering round of applause. All right. So you all do us very proud here at the Academy, and we're so happy to have honored you today. Now, um, next, uh, we're having the garden party on the Academy's West Lawn. I think that normally the party is scheduled to start at four, but as always, the party starts when you all get there. So <laughs> have a great time.